Good evening. I'm Marcy Kahn. I'm chair of the New York City Bar Task Force on the Rule of Law. And I welcome you to this fourth and final session in our series on new frontiers in federalism. Our previous sessions, the first one on changing tides of federalism, the second on interstate and regulatory clashes, commerce, corporate conduct, and the corporate law, and the third on abortion and the chaos of conflicting mandates were presented last May, and the video recordings are all available on the City Bar website. We have put a link in the chat uh, that's available uh, so you can view any of our uh, videos of our previous sessions. I strongly commend these three previous sessions for your review if you missed them in the spring. The series is intended to take a hard look at how recent Supreme Court decisions, such as Dobbs and West Virginia versus EPA, as well as state legislative changes, are challenging our understanding of federalism in terms of relations among the states and between the states and between the states and the federal government. During these sessions, we bring together national thought leaders to probe the new federalism environment for judicial, legislative, and administrative agency action through discussion of issues such as corporate conduct, reproductive rights, environmental regulation, and voting rights. And we ponder the future of nationwide responses to these issues bearing so closely on the lives of ordinary Americans. Our presentation this evening is entitled Reconfiguring Governance, Navigating the Red-Blue Divide in America, and will build on our prior sessions by taking a deeper look at the clashes among governments and the stress test on our federal system arising from the need for national solutions to problems affecting all Americans while calls are being made to dismantle the agencies established to address them, including the EPA, FBA, FBI, IRS, and departments of education and justice, and as judicial rulings cut back on their authority to act. We are increasingly seeing conflicting lines of authority among the various levels of government and shifting notions of judicial review of executive action. We ask, is this just the natural result of our federal constitutional system? Are there lessons we should have learned from our historical experience, especially the years leading up to the Civil War? What are we to make of all of the actions of state governments in the 21st century defying the federal government, as Texas has in closing the Rio Grande River at Eagle Pass, and as Alabama has in denying the Supreme Court's Voting Rights Act ruling on its redistricting? Are we entering an era of experimentation with new government structures? What does this mean for acceptable notions of executive branch power? What will the future look like for issues such as climate change mitigation, environmental regulation, and immigration? Fortunately for us, we have with us this evening some of the sharpest thinkers of our time who will share their ideas and interact with one another on these and related questions. Before we move into our program though, I want to offer the thanks of the Rule of Law Task Force to the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Center and the Brennan Center for Justice, both at NYU Law School, as well as the six other city bar committees who have co-sponsored our series of programs. And many thanks to our series program chair, Robert Cusimano, who's here with us this evening, for conceiving this timely series of programs, and to Jennifer Rogers, our series co-chair, and to the other members of our planning team for their considerable work in putting this series together, and of course, to the Bar Association staff who made it all happen. I want to address some logistics, and here is a reminder, if you haven't been with us before, of how our Zoom session works. All members of the audience will be muted during the program, the Zoom chat function is disabled for audience members, but we encourage your questions and would suggest you type them into the Q&A function. We will try to get to them 
as many of them as we can as, as time permits. Now this evening's session promises to be lively and you'll hear more about our format in a moment from our moderator. Our panelists tonight will offer insights which I am sure will intrigue you. I'm going to offer brief introductions of them now. Noah Rosenblum is an assistant professor of law at NYU School of Law, where he teaches and writes in the fields of administrative law, constitutional law, and legal history. Concurrently, a PhD candidate in intellectual and legal history at Columbia University, his research takes an historical approach to the study of state institutions and seeks to address ways in which the law can be used to promote democratic accountability. His current focus includes the intersection of constitutional law, administrative law, and presidential powers, examining the history of the president in the administrative state. Professor Rosenblum is a frequent commentator on legal current events and was recently the subject of an interview by Isaac Chotner in The New Yorker in response to reports earlier this summer of Donald Trump's plans to increase his presidential powers should he be reelected. Rick Sue is a professor of law at the University of North Carolina School of Law, where he teaches and writes in the areas of local government law, immigration, and federalism. Professor Sue is a co-author of the casebook, State and Local Government Law. His incisive article in the University of Pennsylvania Journal of Constitution of Law, Constitutional Law on Intrastate Federalism probes how the role traditionally played by principles of federalism has evolved in reverse to encompass the growing divide between states and localities within them. Professor Sue's recent focus has followed how the shifting roles of state and local government entities has been altered, including by principles of preemption, and affects the contours of federalism as well as the current realities of local government functioning. He too writes and speaks frequently and has been the recipient of multiple awards for his teaching. Katrina Wyman is the Wilf Family Professor of Property Law at NYU School of Law where she also serves as faculty director of the law school's LLM program in environmental and energy law and is faculty director of NYU's, NYU Law's Frank J. Guarini Center on Environmental Energy and Land Use Law. She teaches and researches in the areas of property, urban environmental law, and natural resources law, among other subjects, probing new concepts in those fields. Professor Wyman's current focus has also included examination of the Supreme Court's recent pronouncements on the major questions doctrine and the dormant commerce, commerce clause and their impact on climate and environmental regulation, both by the states and the federal government. She also views the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act as a new approach to federalism in the climate arena. Professor Wyman too has been recognized for her excellence in teaching. Our moderator of these three brilliant scholars will be our series chair, Robert Cusimano, a veteran of the City Bar Association, former chair of the City Bar Fund, and a member of the association's rule of law task force since its inception. Bob has a distinguished record of rule of law work, both in this country and abroad, and is the founder of Legal Horizons Foundation, which is dedicated to enhancing the rule of law in the United States and around the world. This new Frontiers of Federalism series is the second series he has developed for us after his very successful five-part series in 2020 on preserving the rule of law in an age of disruption. That too is available at the link at the uh, web, uh, website. Um, I wanna correct an error that I have made and I deeply regret it. And uh, that is that Dr. Noah Rosenblum has now achieved the PhD uh, in intellectual uh, and legal history. And I don't mean to suggest that he's still uh, Marcy, it's chasing just, after it's just for my Just for my mother, having spent so many years on that doctorate, you know, she really would want me to make sure that- uh... I do not want to cross your mother, Noah. Okay, so- um, uh, as I say, the, um, our prior programs are all available on the links of the website. And uh, right now, I'm going to turn it over to Bob 
to launch our discussion. Bob, you're, mute, you're muted, Bob. You, you need to unmute and start over. Hi, everybody. Um, this, this is Bob Cusimano. I'm um, the mediator tonight. Um, we're going to have three se segments with three distinguished guests, as you know. Um, after each of the um, sessions, I will probably have one or two questions for um, each speaker, and then we'll move on to the next segment. Um, after all three segments are done, we're going to have a moderated um, discussion, an open-ended kind of d discussion on all kinds of issues around federalism, but also the 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 uh, title um, speaks um, as well to our to our overall program, um, which is the the red um, blue divide in America, both nationally and state by state. Um, so with that, um, I'll turn it over to Professor Rosenblum. Um, you have the Zoom. Thank you. Um, I hope everybody can hear me all right. So um, in our planning session, I was asked to offer first some general thoughts to contextualize what uh, Rick, Katrina, and myself are going to be talking about this evening, and then talk a little bit more about my specific area of interest, um, which, as is relevant to this conversation, Marcy already alluded to, the matter I discussed with Isaac, uh, the question of the bureaucracy. So the backdrop to some of what we're living through right now is an epical transformation in many aspects of American public law, particularly the law that governs the federal government's powers, and so has to do with the powers that other actors, whether in the federal government or in the states and local governments, are able to exercise. Um, I'm a legal historian, so if you'll indulge me for a second, we can think about the sweep of American power and say that the federal government expanded power tremendously during the New Deal in the 1930s and in the New Deal's aftermath. And the truth is this growth of federal power is something that basically everybody got on board with. Um, both parties, the Democrats who were in charge during the New Deal and the Republicans who succeeded them, eventually made their peace with expanded federal power. They could use it to get the things they wanted done, done. The institutions of the government eventually got on board with it too. There were some moments when it looked like that might not happen. So there was a moment under Chief Justice William Rehnquist when it looked like the Supreme Court might use federalism as a kind of freestanding doctrine, our federalism famously, to try to rein in some of what the federal government might be able to do to put a curb on power. There were a couple of moments earlier in the Roberts court and the tenure of Chief Justice John Roberts when it looked like his court too might use some combination of the Commerce Clause and maybe a narrow reading of the enforcement powers under the 14th Amendment to try to rein in federal power as well. But Basically, I think it's fair to say that the growth in federal power that we saw in the aftermath of the New Deal subsisted more or less unchallenged by at least legal elites until the rise of Donald Trump and the transformations that has wrecked upon our political system. We can talk more about that um, now or during the Q&A. But um, I put it to you, there's been a shift. Something is changing. Change is in the air. Um, and it's coming in part from the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court's doctrine. There are a few different tools that the Supreme Court has used to uh, go after the New Deal consensus, to undo the New Deal order, and in particular to try to rein in some of this expansive federal power. One tool that Marcy already alluded to is the major questions doctrine and some of the suggestions about the non-delegation doctrine that have sometimes gone along with that. Those have, of course, put a chill over administrative law, the field that I tend to work in. There have been changes to Commerce Clause jurisprudence and federalism and the Takings Clause that have had major effects on how state and local governments are able to operate in a host of different areas. Um, and of course, the Supreme Court's approach to pollution standards, sometimes head on and sometimes collaterally through other doctrines, has materially changed environmental law. Uh, we are still sorting out what this means for all levels of government and what it means to do regulation in light of these new doctrines. Critically, 
it does seem like these changes are going to have differential effects on the basis of the policy area you're looking at. And so probably between red and blue America too. So I know this isn't a panel on the major questions doctrine, but I can't resist. The major questions doctrine, as you've probably heard, uh, at least if you're in a law school, you hear about it all the time these days. It's great for administrative law professors. It's like a full employment program for us and our classes. But for everybody else, the major questions doctrine, it, it makes it harder for agencies to regulate in something that is deemed a major question. Now, this may sound pretty neutral, right? All agencies, if they're dealing with a major question, there's going to be greater scrutiny. But in fact, this will tend to prevent agency action and limit regulation, right? If you're an agency, now you're going to be really worried about whether you're regulating something that is a major question or not. You're going to tend to second guess yourself. Um, given that government regulatory activity tends to be uh, uh, pro-social and uh, tends to be in line with many of the goals of the New Deal, if you chill government regulation and regulatory activity, that might be good for red America and bad for blue America, right? It's a neutral policy, but it will actually have a differential partisan impact. Um, maybe more subtly, if we put our legal process hats on, the major questions doctrine lets judges scrutinize major regulatory activity more carefully. In other words, it shifts power from agencies to judges in this way that's really discretion heavy, right? A judge now gets to look at agency action and ask, is this a major question or not? And if it is, then the judiciary can reach in. So in other words, you're shifting power from what we might think of as pro-regulatory blue actors, agencies, to um, anti-regulatory federalist society red actors, judges. Okay, general point is that um, these kinds of decisions that the Supreme Court is making matter a ton for questions of regulation across the red-blue divide. Now, as I just said, this isn't another session about the major questions doctrine, although um, I kind of wish it were. You can always come talk to me about the major questions doctrine. Uh, our plan is to look at other related areas. So uh, that was my little introductory canned spiel now I'm going to get into the subject of my presentation for you today, which has to do with the bureaucracy and how uh, decisions have affected the bureaucracy. Um, after me, you're going to get Rick to come on and talk a little bit about state and local governments. And then Katrina will um, close our session out by talking about the environment. So I'm going to pause and take a drink of water to mark the break. Okay, bureaucracy. So um, what is bureaucracy? When I teach about bureaucracy, I like to point out that the Constitution doesn't actually say anything about the federal bureaucracy. There's an allusion to executive departments and the president gets to request opinions in writing. But the bureaucracy is overwhelmingly a creature of statute, even though the Constitution anticipates that there will be all kinds of people working for the government. Um, the bureaucracy, as we tend to think of it, that dreaded deep state is really the civil service. And so it's a product of the late 19th and early 20th century and the movement for civil service reform. Once upon a time, everybody who worked for the government was a hack who was connected with a political party and they got their position basically as a payoff for helping the political party do the work of getting the candidates on the party slate elected. You um, knock on your neighbor's doors, they reward you by making you the postman or whatever. There are major problems with that. Uh, the obvious one is that every time a new president comes in, everybody in the government gets fired. So there's no continuity. This is the dreaded spoil system or rotation in office. Also, might not surprise you to know that if you get your post office gig because you're good at turning out votes, you might not be very good as a postman. And you might be more interested in getting what's good for you than delivering the mails. Um, so spoil system, not that effective. Uh, over the course of the late 19th century, we start to build out a professionalized executive uh, 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 agency, uh, executive agencies, professionalized civil service, staffed with um, experts, or at the very least, people who are competent to do the work of government. And in order to keep them in government, we offer them the opportunity to have stable careers, um, regular promotion, 
all the kinds of boring things that might make you want to devote your life to um, the trenches of federal service. By the time we get to the 1960s, the federal service is pretty well established and in place. But there are there, there's always some tension between the civil service and political leaders. And the tension exists on both the left and the right. So from the left, the fear is that this allegedly neutral expert civil service is just going to be captured by industry. So you think about, you know, who's going to actually write the rules to regulate energy law. It'd be great if they were all neutral scientists, but those scientists are coming from somewhere. Maybe they're actually coming from the very energy companies that we want our regulations to police. And so folks on the left start to worry that regulatory agencies have been taken over under the guise of neutral scientific expertise by the very parties they're supposed to be regulating. On the right, the fear is a little bit different. And this is mostly connected with somebody like Richard Nixon. There's this idea that because these agencies tend to be pro-social, pro-regulatory, they're staffed with pinko commie leftists who are secretly out to undermine conservative policy programs. So Richard Nixon becomes convinced that the bureaucracy is out to get him. So he tries to construct a shadow bureaucracy inside the White House. So there have always been these tendencies, a kind of fear of capture on the left that wants a little bit more political control, and on the right, a different kind of fear of capture, that the permanent state is out to get and prevent um, conservative priorities from being realized. But um, the civil service just works so well compared to the alternatives that it nevertheless endures with a lot of stability. That civil service is more or less protected by doctrine. So this is going to get us into a slightly arcane area of constitutional law known as removal jurisprudence. Until the, the Constitution doesn't say anything about bureaucracy, it also doesn't say anything about how you get fired from the federal government. This is um, an unusual oversight. Uh, I can go on at great length about this, so I'll restrain myself, but I'll say that in many situations, office holding was almost like a species of property. There's an amazing scholar at Temple University, Jane Manners. She's been working on this. Turns out you've got like wills disputes over drawing the salary to somebody's office after they've passed away. It's almost heritable, right? It's almost like a form of property. So you really do have to figure out how you can get somebody out of their job, how you can fire them, maybe because they're dead and you want a replacement to do the work, or um, maybe because you don't, you don't like their policy direction and you want to take things in a new direction. Now, the standard rule is what's called removal is an incident of appointment. That's how they say it in this famous 1930s case, 1830s case, excuse me, um, Henry Hennen. Um, and what does it mean to say that it's an incident of appointment? Basically, if I can appoint you to the office, well, then I can displace the person who's currently in the office by appointing someone new to it, right? To put someone new in the position as an incident of that power, I have to get rid of the person who was there before. That might or might not mean that I have a separate freestanding power of removal, does that make sense, right? If I can put somebody in as part of that process, I can displace, but I might or might not have the power to just remove outright. And this question is deeply unsettled across the 19th century. Some of you may remember the Civil War and the impeachment of Andrew Johnson, right? When Andrew Johnson is impeached, it's because he refuses to abide by a law that Congress had passed that purported to prevent the president from removing high cabinet officers without Senate concurrence, which sort of makes sense. If you're appointed to the position with confirmation of the Senate, well, maybe you can remove, but only with confirmation of the Senate also. Now that uh, case, the or statute, excuse me, the famous Tenure in Office Act is maybe overruled by a decision from 1926 called Myers v. United States. I say maybe because by the time Myers is decided, that statute, the Tenure and Office Act, has already been repealed by Congress. Taft, uh, the president who becomes Chief Justice, who writes Myers, goes out of his way to say, I'm overruling the Tenure of Office Act, but that's clearly dicta because the act was no longer on the books. Whatever. Don't get me started. That case establishes the proposition that the president should have at least some removal power over people inside the executive branch, that the president can fire bureaucrats, 
But just nine years later, in another case called Humphrey's Executor, the Supreme Court reverses course. It's a court that includes some of the same people who decided Myers the United States. And in that case, they say Congress has the power to insulate certain high government officials from removal by the president. And a fortiori, if Congress can protect high government officials, they can definitely, definitely protect lower government officials from removal. So back to the civil service, right? How did it work? Where did it come from? Like I said, we want to entice people into government to have nice long careers. So we have to offer them some protection from just being fired at the whim of a new president who disagrees with them politically. And Humphrey's executor certainly gave a solid foundation to that kind of civil service protector protection. Excuse me, that's 1935. So that's the state of the law all the way until 2009. Doesn't mean there isn't pushback. Famously, in the 1980s, there's a Supreme Court case called Morrison v. Olson, in which there's a question about the removability of the special counsel. And the Supreme Court rules eight to one that, of course, Congress can make the special counsel immune from being fired by the president. After all, Humphrey's executor from 1935 said that was OK. There is one dissenter. He's way out there. He writes and says, you know, I think that Taft got it right in 1926. And the way that I read that old Myers opinion, the president should have the power to fire the special counsel and no one should be able to stop them. That judge um, gets criticized by his colleagues. William Rehnquist, the conservative chief justice, the Nixon appointee, he writes the majority opinion in Morrison. He says, you know, that dissenter, he's just trying to get more than the words will bear with this crazy opinion that's way out there. That dissenting judge, the one who was way out on a limb so far that he couldn't get even a single vote with him, that was Antonin Scalia. That opinion would turn out to be very influential, even though it was so far outside what anyone imagined that, like I said, the conservatives on the court um, left him out there to dry. So, OK, why do I say so much about that Scalia opinion? Because it ended up having this subterranean influence that came together with Donald Trump's election to transform our law and get us to where we are today. So let me tell you first about the subterranean influence of that Scalia opinion, and then I'll tell you about Donald Trump. So Scalia writes this opinion, this dissent in Morrison v. Olson, and he makes this very simplistic schoolhouse rock argument about how separation of powers is supposed to work in the Constitution. He says, look, there are three powers, legislative, judicial, and executive. The Constitution gives the legislative to Congress, the judicial to the judiciary, and the executive to the president. And just to the president, Article 2 begins, the executive power shall vest. Okay, so that means that all of the executive power vests in the person of the president. What is executive power? I don't know. But I know what legislative power is. That goes to Congress. And I know what judicial power is. That goes to the courts. So anything that is not what Congress does or what the courts do must be executive power, which means it must be within the direct control of the person of the president. Now, like I said, that argument was rejected as completely bonkers, but there's a certain elegance to it, especially if you really are committed to this very formalistic, simplistic, tripartite separation of powers. The founders weren't. The Constitution isn't, but there are some scholars who are. Many of those scholars were actually connected with Anthony and Scalia. Some of them were his law clerks at the D.C. Circuit. Some of them were his clerks at the United States Supreme Court. Many of them went on to get jobs in the American Academy, in which they started to elaborate this theory in Morrison v. Olson into a comprehensive approach to separation of powers law with consequence for the power of the president. Um, while they were not especially influential at first, they did go on to have a lot of influence through an organization that I've already mentioned, the Federalist Society. Indeed, Stephen Calabrese, who's probably the most influential early theorist of this, this way of thinking about presidential power, um, not only was he closely connected with Anthony and Scalia, but he was one of the founders of the Federalist Society. And so many students who came up through the Federalist Society and judges who were in the Federalist Society orbit were exposed to these arguments. 
Over time, those arguments made their way from the academy onto the bench. And so in a case from 2009 called Free Enterprise Fund, we see for at least the first time since Morrison v. Olson, and I think the first time in the majority opinion ever, that kind of argument about presidential power applied to an analysis of an administrative agency. Now, for a variety of reasons, Free Enterprise Fund itself turned out not to have a huge effect on the law, but it introduced into the majority jurisprudence this idea that agencies would be suspect if they weren't in some way under the control of the president, more or less directly. That um, suggestion turned into uh, a, a hard rule of agency design in a case from just a few years ago called SALA Law v. CFPB that took Scalia's opinion in Morrison v. Olson and essentially made it into the majority opinion. Um, and the ramifications of that shift continue to be felt. There was a case um, from just two terms ago called Arthrex v. United States, in which the Supreme Court examined the Patent Trial and Appeals Board, which had a number of adjudicators who were insulated from presidential control and said that that design was unconstitutional because the president couldn't remove them. And it did something truly unprecedented. It reached into the agency and rearranged the reporting lines so that the decisions would be made by people that the president could directly supervise. This remedy was so shocking that Clarence Thomas wrote in dissent, I genuinely don't understand what we're doing here, where we have the power to do this, or what problem we're solving by doing it. So, okay, part one of the story, Scalia's dissent in Morrison v. Olson exercises a subterranean influence through the academy and the judiciary, and reemerges 45 years later as the new law in separation of powers. So what? Well, enter Donald Trump. So when Trump is elected, a major part of his candidacy is to change how Washington operates. I'm going to drain the swamp, he says. Highly suspicious of the deep state, even of elites within his own party. Now you'll recall that he faces some real pushback, especially at first over who he's going to put in positions of power and what sort of authority they're going to have. But eventually, the Republican Party elites get on board, at least with staffing major parts of his government. And we've now learned from the investigations into the January 6th insurrection, those party elites were instrumental at various points over the course of his presidency in preventing Donald Trump from engaging in illegal actions. He may have engaged in illegal actions anyway. That's not the subject of our panel. But if you think about the role of the White House counsel, for example, I guess this came out more during the first impeachment hearing, right? You had these, these, um, these swamp creatures who, who prevented this uh, uh, president who was interested in, um, well, you know, he said, I have an article two and it lets me do whatever I want. So who had this very kingly understanding of the power of the president, it was the swamp creatures in the bureaucracy who said to him, actually, Mr. President, that's not the authority that you have, and either prevented him from acting or countermanded his orders. Um, this was a subject of major debate in the administrative law community, since it's not obvious that civil servants should have that authority. Although, of course, many of them have sworn an independent oath to uphold the Constitution, so it gets really interesting very quickly. But some of you may recall there was that op-ed in the New York Times about being part of the Trump administration, but nevertheless part of the resistance. So by the time Trump is done with his term, there's a real sense that the bureaucrats who he had eventually joined forces with were actually restraining him from realizing his vision. When Trump left office or was, you know, final, finally was, uh, uh, was, was, was relinquished power, um, that sense that the bureaucracy was going to prevent right-wing priorities from being achieved, that Nixonian idea had spread throughout Trump world and the elite precincts of the GOP, who of course had now gotten on board with Donald Trump as party leader, and went from being a kind of fringe position to a, pol a political platform, a, a policy vision. And so the Heritage Foundation, which is a kind of old school conservative think tank that has gotten on board with um, the kind of Trumpification of the Republican Party, 
they took this challenge on and started thinking, wait, okay, suppose that we had another Trump presidency. Suppose that it is the case that the deep state is out to prevent the realization of conservative policy priorities. What tools could we use to remake the deep state and replace these anti-conservative operatives with our own people? So that, of course, you know, helped realize Donald Trump's vision of what he might do were he to come back to power, right? Having loyal servants in office who wouldn't countermand his orders. And it also helps revive and realize this older um, policy priority. So um, uh, 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 this is where the new jurisprudence of the Supreme Court intersects with the new direction of the Republican Party in a way that boring, staid administrative law lovers like myself start to get really worried because the Supreme Court has remade our law around separation of powers to suggest that the president does need to have control over what happens inside the executive branch, what's sometimes called the unitary executive theory. Meanwhile, you have a political party and a president who are, or a former president and presidential candidate who are looking to appoint people to office who will allow that person to realize their vision, a vision that we know from past experience was illegal in some ways. So, oh my God, Right? Could this could this really happen? Um, so let me just say two final thoughts about uh, what does this have to do with the red blue divide, and what does this have to do with federalism? So the red blue divide first. Um, once upon a time, not too long ago, this vision I've just laid out to you wouldn't have been about the red blue divide at all. Right, even President Ronald Reagan, a rock ribbed Republican, if ever there was one, who, as part of his presidency, rearranged the way government bureaucracy operated and spent a lot of time crusading against what he saw as the depredations of government bureaucrats. Even somebody like Reagan was really on board with civil service tenure, with expert administration in many parts of government, with boring swamp creatures who were going about doing the work of government particularly, although not exclusively, in agencies that advance Republican Party priorities. So until pretty recently, this would have been thought of as an opposition between, I don't know, elites and non-elites. And I don't mean that pejoratively. I just mean people who are sort of exercising power and those who aren't, or a division between um, government servants and, and those who are not interested in government service. But it now has become a red-blue divide because of the way in which Donald Trump has remade the Republican Party and that party's priorities, right? Remember, the Heritage Foundation, hardly a MAGA radical outfit before Donald Trump, is now um, front and center of this project. Okay, what does this have to do with federalism? Well, as we're about to hear, federalism comes in a ton of different forms. One of the most important forms of federalism is a kind that's never taught in law school and doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution. It's state-federal administrative partnerships, right? It's federal government administrators working with state administrators on these cooperative federalist projects to try to realize policy priorities. That partnership depends on there being expertise at both the federal government and the state government level. If you get rid of the administrative state at the federal government level, even if nothing else changes, and of course a lot of other stuff would change, you would nevertheless, you would, you would erode the foundation of these federal state partnerships. So you're transforming the nature of cooperative federalism. And then, and this is what I'll close on, you're also changing something about the way that the state and federal governments interact in more conflictual spaces. So um, Heather Gherkin, an old teacher of mine, currently the Dean of Yale Law School, has written in a really creative way about how in the American political system, there aren't really any permanent losers or permanent winners. And institutions are always articulated. If you can't get your policy implemented at one level, you can retreat to another level. If the conservatives are in charge in the White House, maybe the liberals can retreat inside the federal government to other agencies, what Jennifer No, another incredible scholar, describes as burrowing. But if you make the federal government more unified, you eliminate that pluralism inside the government. And that will actually polarize the states in an unexpected way. Because if the federal government is controlled by pinko commie radicals all the way down from top to bottom, well, then if you're from a red state or a conservative state, 
you have to take an oppositional posture. Whereas flip side, if the government is controlled by conservative reactionaries, well, then if you're a blue state, your identity is going to be defined in opposition. And that, of course, is going to set up a ton of conflicts and fights in a way that if they're both more pluralist and more divided, you'll have unusual cooperations, allyship, some opposition, um, and of course, the kind of messy log rolling that is a hallmark of actual functional democratic government. Um, I know I went on a little bit too long, but I'll pause there and kick it back to our moderator. Great. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to just focus on one particular couple of things that are very much the same um, with regard to the the bureaucracy, um, which is the movement, the seeming movement <clears throat> in now and probably in the future or possibly in the future to radically change the rules of the road for the civil service, not to mention the Department of Justice itself, right, in terms of um, promised uh, promising um, campaign reform with regard to changing the nature of the discretion and the politicization and the, the personnel within that part of the federal government. Um, can you give us a, a, a few um, thoughts about where that might go? So the, the first thing to flag is that this transformation is not going away for better or worse, right? The fact that institutions like the Heritage Foundation have gotten on board means that even when um, Donald Trump is no longer the leader of the Republican Party, it sounds like there is going to be at least one of the two major parties that's going to be pushing for some kind of real transformation to the civil service. So we really do have to grapple with the question that Robert is asking. Um, so the first part, you know, what would this transformation look like? I mean, at the end of Trump's term, he proposed something kind of uh, very far reaching, which was he asked every agency to make a list of all of the policymaking personnel inside the agency. And he then wanted to reclassify all of those policy discretion types from the civil service to the appointative service, basically to allow the president to just pick them. Um, this didn't get very far for two reasons. One, it was the end of his term, and so uh, the clock ran out. But two, agencies were just totally overwhelmed by the problem of figuring out who had policymaking discretion. Because depending on how you define policy setting, that could include everybody from the clerk who's deciding whether or not to approve your visa all the way up to the secretary of state, right? And go agency by agency. So um, the new approach that the Heritage Foundation has brought is less about reclassification and more about making a list of allies. So less expand the president's power to appoint, more take advantage of the president's power to appoint to put in our guys instead of their guys. But that raises its own problems, right? That is the 1830s Jacksonian spoil system just come back to life. And if we're gonna go back to picking our, you know, food and drug agency administrators on the basis of who's best at turning out votes for Democrats or Republicans, mm -hmm. I don't think that's gonna be great for the cold medicine that we go to take, you know, at CVS. So, um, I think that the, the civil service has lots of obvious problems, uh, but at least the two current reform efforts on the table, I think are unlikely to be hugely popular or successful. Just one more piece about that first one, the policymaking one. Actually, this applies to both of them. If you shift any of these offices from the civil service to the president, you run into this like basic boring problem, which is how is the president going to go about picking these people? So Heritage is trying to solve that problem by pre-vetting a long list of folks. But the truth is, in the 19th century, they pre-vetted folks too, right? It was just the folks who volunteered on the campaigns. And just the simple time it took to appoint folks was so long and exhausting, it destroyed presidents. James Garfield, one of my favorites, um, his assassination is what leads to the enactment of the civil service laws. During his brief time as president, before he gets shot, he spends his time complaining about how all his days are consumed with appointing people to office. And then he's shot by a disappointed office seeker. So <laughs> there are lots of problems with the presidency, but I think we run the risk of um, 
of reviving some of the kind of least sexy and most terrible parts of the way it used to roll. The DOJ question, Robert's second question, is like decidedly on the sexy side of the line, right? The 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 DOJ is an incredibly august professional institution, and there have been some pretty um, irresponsible uh, uh, political attacks against it. Um, it's remarkable that despite all of these political attacks under Trump and Biden, the department seems to have really held pretty close to its internal norms. We can criticize those norms, but this is um, you know, what you would expect of a well-functioning bureaucracy. Uh, I think most of the debate around the future of the DOJ in a kind of new world of presidential control involves the extent to which the DOJ can or cannot be made independent of the presidency. This really revives arguments from the 1970s about how you can check the executive. This was really present after Nixon, right? The inspectors general were part of this attempt to create internal checks on executive overreach. Um, the problem is that we know if you make prosecutors completely independent of the president, you can wind up with the kind of special counsel problems we've seen under both Democrats and Republicans in the last 20 years. So um, if it sounds like I'm talking around the problem, Robert, I don't mean to. They're hard problems. <laughs> and we've actually got enough experiment in American history to see the downsides of these different approaches. But I think that should make us suspicious of radical change, because we know that the system we have, while having its problems, is something that's evolved to, to, to address particular issues with all the previous ways we had of doing things. I, I'd love to spend more time talking about the deep plumbing of the deep state, um, and I'm, but I'm going to hold some of that for the, the conversation um, at the end. So I'm going to turn over to, um, to um, Professor Sue to talk about um, state and, and local aspects um, of the federalism uh, in general. All right. Thank you, Robert. So Noah ended his story talking about Trump and, of course, his plan to dismantle the deep state, if you will, right, the administrative state. Uh, so I'm going to start actually with his rival, Governor DeSantis. Uh, and I'm starting with DeSantis not just because DeSantis disagrees with Trump. He doesn't, right? He himself also says that if he gets into office, he will dismantle the deep state and assume more presidential control over essentially the administrative agencies. But I think what sets DeSantis apart from Trump in some ways is that he's already carried out a version of this as governor in Florida. So just in his time as Florida, he's removed two independently locally elected prosecutors. Uh, he spearheaded the restoration of the office of the sheriff in Miami-Dade and has now signed a bill that will transfer control of the police department to that sheriff in 2025. He's passed preemption bills as given the governor oversight over police budgets in all cities in the state. And you might have heard he's taken over uh, Reedy Creek Special District uh, that serves Disney, right? Just, I don't like Disney, so I'm taking over your local government, right? So as you can see from this discussion, what I want to focus on is localism, by which I mean the relationship between the state and its local governments. And a lot of my talk later on is going to be about developments in this front and showing how what's happening in Florida is in some ways a much sort of broader trend. But I also want to, given this topic, connect it to federalism. And I'm going to do it by asserting two points. Uh, the first point is that federalism assumes localism, that understanding that there are not only administrative agencies in the federal government, but also agencies, if you will, at the, uh, the state level in the local government is also sort of instrumental how we think about carrying out cooperative federalism or even competitive federalism uh, in the state and federal relationship. The second is that federalism fights have long been actually about local divides, divides not just between states, but within states. And certainly today, in which a lot of the partisan divide is now geographic, right, between city and suburb, urban and rural, we're likely to see a lot of the federalism fights really being a translation of these divides within the states themselves. Now, I want to go into more detail on both of these a little bit to kind of give you a little bit of the setup towards, I think, the structure that I'm talking about. So with regard to the first, right, federalism assumes localism. Now, of course, what's interesting is just as the Constitution doesn't really mention the administrative structure of the federal government itself, it also doesn't mention local governments at all in the constitutional structure. 
But we can presume that it's always been instrumental. They've always existed in the way that we imagine state and local, uh, federal and state relations sort of imagines that there are local governments there. Now, on the one hand, of course, it's just obvious, right? When we think about the state governments, local governments are their creatures and their agents, right? State governments, yes, are sovereign, but most of the things that they carry out are through their local government uh, 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 within the states, whether it's counties or cities or even special districts. But it's also interesting to note that the local governments are oftentimes partners and collaborators with the federal government. When the federal government rolls out some sort of program, it's oftentimes the local officials who are on the front lines that are often are responsible for carrying those out. So as a result, what I want to suggest is actually the federalism balance that we talk about, right, between the state and the federal government oftentimes depends on the way they relate to local governments or mediate their authority through local governments. So Noah, for example, mentions the New Deal. And of course, a traditional story, the New Deal is a centralization of power in the federal government. But of course, as other historians have also noted, right, Mollenkopf has noted, a lot of that centralization of federal power was actually an expansion of their relationship with cities and local governments, right, setting up essentially programs that were being carried out by local governments and, and oftentimes skirting the states entirely. So on housing, on infrastructure, on education, you have tons of federal money being channeled directly to city governments oftentimes and close collaboration between federal administrative agencies and city governments. Ironically, the standard argument for the reversal of the New Deal or the partial reversal, the new federalism revival, right? Nixon, uh, Reagan is often sort of thought about as like a decentralization, taking power away from the federal government, giving it back uh, to the states. But the funny thing is, for most cities, they experience that as actually a re-centralization, that essentially the authority was being concentrated in the states. Instead of money being channeled directly to them, it was now being allocated in block grants. Everything gets mediated through the state government. So it wasn't that anyone was really interested in dismantling the federal government. They're still doling out money. It was just whether or not it was going directly to the cities or going to the state government. And I would say today we're seeing some of that dynamic today when we're talking about immigration or later on environmental regulation. Oftentimes it's who's controlling the local governments, right? Are there going to be partners with the federal government or are there going to be partners with the state government? And who is going to essentially be uh, the sort of channel of authority, if you will, with regard to those particular actions? Now, the second point I want to make is that federalism fights, which are structured as federal state conflict are also really, in most cases, actually about the local divide. Now, the first point to that is just to note that if federalism oftentimes revolves around partisan divides, right, the red state divide, that the red state divide actually is, for the most part today and in the past as well, at the local level. Yes, we talk about red states and blue states, but really the partisan divide is within states, is within different parts of the state. Uh, as I noted before, before it was mostly city and suburb, now it's urban rural, now we're trying to figure out where the suburbs are, right? But these exist in every state. And certainly in New York, right, the divide, if you're from New York and you actually understand it, is between upstate and downstate, right? New York is not a behemoth. And certainly here in North Carolina, you know, the divide between what most people know, the metropolitan region, Charlotte and the Triangle. Uh, on the other hand, people forget that North Carolina has the second largest rural population in the country, right? Uh, and that tension within North Carolina is what makes it purple, but it's not purple. It's just really blue and really red. And what's interesting is in some ways, a lot of the traditional federalism battles, the cases that we study, really underlying it are these intrastate fights. Uh, so one of the biggest cases in federalism, you may know, U.S. versus New York, uh, has to do, you know, early sort of uh, decision about anti-commandeering, federal government commandeering the state uh, electoral process. Now, what was interesting about that case was it was about the disposal of low-level radioactive waste, a federal law that was passed. And it was always interesting because New York State was actually part of the coalition of states that developed that law that got the federal government to pass it. So why did they challenge the federal government afterwards? Well, the divide wasn't really between New York and the federal government. The divide was between Allegheny and Cortland County, rural counties that they were trying to cite the radioactive waste in, that did massive resistance against the state. And when the state couldn't find... If, in fact, the argument of anti-commandeering was first raised by the counties. They were arguing the state were commandeering the counties, right? And they just retranslated that intentionally into the federal lawsuit. Uh, more recently, in Arizona versus U.S., which I think is going to be a big case, not only because it's about immigration and is part of this recent battle over Texas and its, you know, sort of barriers on the Rio Grande, 
uh, but was also a big case in his own right, right? Arizona said, we can regulate immigration. Federal government sues Arizona and says, you cannot. Again, classic federalism battle, federal power versus state power. But again, what was underlying that particular fight was actually the divide in its largest metropolitan region, Phoenix and Maricopa County, right? It was Maricopa County Sheriff Actually, no, it was the Phoenix mayor that first actually enacted its sanctuary policy and went to the federal government to get them to go crack down on Sheriff Arpaio. When Sheriff Arpaio got cracked down by the federal government, he went to the state legislature and got the state legislature to essentially pass the bill that was challenged. So again, it was a federal state fight. But if you look at the amicus briefs, you look at the sort of alignment of the parties, you really saw local actors and different local actors, right? That was a city suburb fight uh, within the state itself. So what I want to suggest with that is in thinking about essentially the federalism divide, we have to pay attention to how we're thinking about the relationship between the state and local governments. And I think what's interesting today is that is also radically changing, right? So if there is a movement afoot to change how we think about the federal administrative bureaucracy, there's also huge changes right now with regard to how states are reimagining the, their relationship with their own local governments. And more specifically, I want to talk about two trends. One is the Ripper legislation. It's a term actually for the 19th century that is being repeated today. I'll explain that in a little bit. And the other is something that is common. It's obviously a newer term. It's called Death Star preemption. Um, that has been around for a while, but I'll talk about that as well. But these are two big terms. Death Star clearly is not from the 19th century, um, unless it's referenced. I don't know. So maybe there's a different type of Death Star at that time. Yeah, but either way is what I want to talk about. So the Ripper legislation, which actually New York was also a big part of in the 19th century, but uh, essentially was a series of legislation uh, that was passed in the mid to late 19th century. Uh, and it was called Ripper because essentially what states were doing was not just controlling the local governments, they were just entirely taking them over. Taking over specific departments, taking over specific offices. Uh, people forget, you know, NYPD was the first police department to be set up. Ten years after it was set up, the state took it over. Right. Uh, in fact, they took over almost every major state, took over almost a, every major uh, police department in the country. Uh, and the Ripper legislation, in some ways, was part of the reason why we had the home rule movement to sort of push back against it. But now we're seeing, I think, a similar version of Ripper legislation really starting to percolate. And I'm really at this point really just talking about like the last year or two. Right. I can go even a little bit further. So I already talked about DeSantis taking over Reedy Creek. Uh, and in some ways, many of the police departments that are in place. Um, one of the biggest examples recently is actually Jackson, Mississippi, right? The largest black uh, city, uh, certainly in the country, but also in Mississippi. Um, so in 2016, the state had already taken over the municipal airport that was owned by Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, in 2023, this is kind of related to what Noah was talking about. Uh, $800 million of federal funds was given to the Jackson water system. And then the state proposed a bill to take over the water system. Right. Uh, in But more, I think, uh, what's been getting news now is uh, a, a pair of bills that was signed in April that essentially creates a city within the city by carving out a predominantly white neighborhood into a separate, quote unquote, judicial district. But what does a judicial district mean? It essentially means that previously local elected prosecutors and local elected judges are now going to be appointed entirely by the state, divorced from essentially the local government itself. Parallel to this, they also created a expansion of the Capitol Police jurisdiction, which essentially means that there will be a state-run police department operating in the city of Jackson. They expanded it to the entire city of Jackson. That is entirely not connected to the city of Jackson at all, uh, entirely accountable to the state. Uh, as one um, uh, official in the city of Jackson says, uh, it is now possible to be arrested by a police department led by a state appointed official, be charged by a state appointed prosecutor, be tried before a state appointed judge, and be sentenced to imprisonment in a state penitentiary, all of which, of course, deviates not only from the system before, but any other local government in Mississippi, right? Uh, Missouri, the funny thing about Missouri is they lost their police department in the 19th century. They just got it back in 2012. And then this year, the Missouri legislature proposed legislation to not only take over the police department, but also the prosecutor's office, right? Um, and it only failed because of a nine hour filibuster, but 
as you can see, many of these bills have been around for a while. Who's to know that's going to happen again? And for those of you who are curious, Kansas City also had their police department take it over. They've never gotten it back. So they've been trying to get it back. Since they're trying to take over St. Louis again, they're not getting it back. Um, political motivations all around this, right? Nashville <laughs> upset the uh, state legislature by blocking the 2024 Republican National Convention. What was the response? Tennessee introduced legislation uh, cutting the size of the city council in half, granting the state control over the city airport and sports stadiums. Um, Florida, I've talked about a lot, uh, but there was another bill recently. Again, these all things escape notice, right? So, you know, Gainesville uh, Utilities, right? Gainesville owns their utilities, uh, was really uh, looking into renewable energy, right? They have made a big commitment to going to renewable energy. Uh, got a lot of criticism from the state. Uh, so then the state proposed a bill uh, to uh, essentially uh, take and to pass the house uh, to take over the city uh, utilities in Gainesville. Um, and of course, Texas has been talking about taking over Austin. They want to follow the Jackson model by declaring it a capital district, like a DC that's entirely essentially not a local government. Uh, and that is getting sort of uh, a sort of uh, advancement as well. On the other hand, I want to talk about besides the sort of resurrection of Ripper legislation, and there's so many. Right, uh, Houston had this, uh, you know, school department, uh, school district to take it over recently. There's so many in recent history as well. But I want to move to another thing, which is called Death Star preemption. This actually started as a term that was applied to an old Michigan law. But what I mean by Death Star preemption here is essentially preemption that isn't just about a particular issue, but is essentially going to eliminate entire huge swaths of local government power, right, over entire areas. And this is to acknowledge that preemption has been escalating for a while, even before getting to death preemption. On the one hand, preemption at the state level has become very broad. So it's not just preempting with, let's say, a state standard. Oftentimes, there is no state standard. The preemption just essentially is broad field preemption that says local governments cannot regulate firearms, immigration, sanctuary policies, environmental regulations, agricultural policies, just sort of stripping those out. We're also seeing trends in so-called punitive preemption. So we like to think preemption used to be boring. Like if you got preempted, then you just say, okay, your local laws can't be enacted or your state laws can't be enforced, right? It's an implementation. It's, you know, just strike it from the books or something. Uh, but now we're imposing a lot more punitive measures, right? Deprivation of state funding, civil and criminal penalties, not just for the city, but also for municipal officials, removal from office. And a lot of this, of course, is since you don't know if you're really preempted half the time until someone tells you it's preempted, the punishment seems to be more about the chilling effect, deterring local government from even considering these issues or even talking about it. Uh, and if you're talking about it, it's going to confusion. There was a Texas anti-sanctuary legislation that would punish you if you had just endorsed a sanctuary policy. You didn't even actually have to pass it. In fact, if you introduced it, you got punished, even if it didn't pass. So this idea of it trying to curtail local government involvement, or as Heather Gerker might say, as a forum in which uh, power can be exercised, seems to be very much here. Um, and we see this in a number of areas. Uh, North Carolina bathroom bill, that was a preemption of essentially Charlotte, right? Um, immigration legislation, firearm regulation being preempted. We're now focusing on criminal justice issues, anti-defunding. Uh, increased uh, control over local prosecutors. I talked about a few that's been expanding as well. But the true Death Star, I think, is what Texas just did, right? So just this year, they passed House Bill 2127. This is the true Death Star legislation. Again, it's a field preemption law that prohibits local governments from regulating certain areas, except the areas are defined as such. Anything about agriculture, about business and commerce, about finance, about insurance, about labor, about local governments, about yourself, about natural resources, about occupations or property, all preempted, right? Not with a state standard, just you cannot regulate that. And this is interesting because Texas is actually a home rule state. Now, there is litigation. The district court has found that this is unconstitutional, but very early on. But it does show, again, and that's because they have a home rule amendment, but there are many states without a home rule amendments. Home rule amendment, actually, interpretation of Texas is not that strong, so I'm not sure if this district court is going, decision is going to hold. But to think about that kind of wide swath of preemption becoming essentially the new norm in lots of states is a complete reconceptualization, if you will, of what local governments do, and more specifically, how state governments operate.
So I want to end a little bit in trying to bring this back to the federalism discussion that we had in the beginning. I think the first point I want to sort of make is essentially that not only is there debates right now about the reconfiguration of the federal government, but there is ongoing debates right now and a strong trend towards the reconfiguration of state and local relationships. And the second of all is that to think about this reconfiguration is also in some ways going to be a reconfiguration of how we think about federalism. If the federal government or the state government needs local governments to carry out their programs, to become partners, to collaborate, or even just to identify issues right on the ground, in some ways, the way we reimagine how those local governments operate, who controls them? Are they entirely under control of the governor? Are they in control of the local uh, residents that elect them? And then essentially sort of restructures how we think about the federal relationship uh, between the state and the federal governments. Uh, and I think in some ways, this also gets back to sort of a broader question that I think we're all facing over how we think about democracy. Because if there is sort of an origin of democracy in some ways, at least democracy as close as the people, it is at the local government. And if we think about in some ways the concern about centralization and about taking that power away, we might be just as concerned about the states, which claim to be local, doing so as much as we might be concerned about the federal government doing so as well. So with that, turn it back to you, Robert. Thanks. Um, you know, without giving you a, a, a long tutorial, uh, um, I was wondering for, for our audience, really, w whether there are any com common denominators among the states um, with regard to their own state constitutions um, and the structure of their mu municipalities, or is it an open field for for um, politics to play? So there is some constitutional foundations, but that really depends on some ways on, and again, I don't want to get too deep into this, sort of the divide between Dillon's rule states and home rule states, right? Whether or not during the 19th century that they followed some movement to encode some sort of protection or some sort of delegated authority constitutionally to local government. So that is the provision that sort of uh, is in place. Now, on the other hand, however, so those vary. Those vary a lot by state. But I think one thing that's even stronger, and some people have made this argument, including you know eminent scholars, uh, and there was a big sort of local government fight over this in the 19th century as well, is whether or not there is just some foundation, not in constitutional text, but essentially just government practice or the way that people understand their relationship with local governments, their pre-existence during colonial era, right? Uh, even during the colonial government days. Uh, that we say that there is a foundation, which I think is, in fact, ubiquitous in practice, which is almost everywhere across, every, almost everywhere across the United States, local government officials are locally elected, right? We do not essentially structure it like almost other, um, other nations, if you will, in which essentially local and provincial governments are merely just sort of delegates from the central government, right? All the people go to the central government, everything sort of comes down in that regard. We've always had a strong tradition of local government. So I think the question is whether or not that tradition holds without essentially explicit constitutional text or constitutional text that doesn't get us all the way there, uh, or whether or not it does become essentially entirely political football. Um, every time we choose local government, I sort of teach the basic laws and my students are very confused. Like that's the way it is. And like it is. <laughs> right. And because it deviates so much from how they understand practice and their relationship with their cities and towns. So maybe I'll, I'll um, try a, a guess um, fr from you about wh where the future um, comes from um, with regard to the fact that virtually all of the urban areas of America are bl blue and um, the suburbs are sort of still a mix and rural is red. And that seems to be defining individual states with regard to their domestic policy. Where does it go from here? Will they keep experimenting or will it settle down in some way? So the interesting thing here, and this is what I've been sort of saying and thinking through myself is we can follow history or we can chart a new course. So following history is this, right? So one thing that's really interesting is a lot of dynamics we're seeing now, the divide between local governments and the state house, uh, the divide between different regions, the sort of heavy hand of state uh, preemption and governance. We saw it all in the 19th century. And what did that actually create? 
it created the home rule movement. It created a movement in which actually across the state, right, many states and many uh, reformers within those states petitioned for more local power and more local protections. So no one's thinking about preemption now. Very few people think about local government power, right? Is this going to trigger a new home rule movement, right? This sort of home rule movement part two, right? So that's one, uh, we follow history. The other is just uncharted, right? The other is actually the consolidation completely, you know, sort of happens uh, and we're going off into a different trajectory. Now, there is administrative problems. I think states think that taking over local governments is such a great idea right now for political reasons. But there was a reason why they also didn't like it in the 19th century is because they don't have the time in annual or biannual sessions to actually do the kind of administrative micromanagement that they think they want to do, right? Uh, and to paralyze, like in Texas, local governments from addressing issues until a biannual you know, legislature convenes to give them the power. Um, so they may rue uh, you know, sort of the return to that. Uh, but then again, we might be charting a new course altogether. So part of me hopes that we'll have a home rule movement part two, and I can live that mo movement. Uh, but there's a part of me that says, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, uh, to the, the, the flip side of federalism is often parallel paralysis so well thank you thank you um so um our third um presenter is um professor wyman who's going to talk also about some federalism issues but particularly from the point of view of um the environment yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I'm in the fortunate position of uh, uh, following upon Noah and Rick, who gave me these really terrific um, um, overviews of developments at the federal and the state and local level. So I'm going to talk about um, basically uh, picking up on some of the themes they developed, sort of the, the curbing of the federal administrative state and the reformulation in some respects of the state and local relationship in the environmental context, okay? So um, it's kind of like a case study of these two trends a little bit in this specific context. And so I'm gonna kind of try to make three points. One is I'm gonna talk about the curbing of the federal of the administrative state by the Supreme Court in the environmental context. Secondly, I'll talk a bit about how even though the federal administrative state is being curbed in the environmental area, there's still room for action at the federal level. It's not completely diminished. Um, and then the third point I wanted to make was um, to, to get at a little bit what is that actually happening at the state and local levels um, um, uh, 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 and, and the mixed reaction that you've seen um, at the state and local levels to the curbing of the federal administrative state. Okay, so going to the point about the curbing of the administrative state and, and um, uh, the environmental law context. So I think a really interesting thing that, um, uh, you know, Noah really brought out the extent to which the Supreme Court through various doctrines like the major questions doctrine um, ha is curbing the authority of these federal administrative agencies, inhibiting their ability to, to innovate. And one thing that really strikes me as, you know, an environmental law professor is how a number of the these new doctrines, new approaches have really been elaborated in the context of environmental cases. So um, uh, just to give a few examples, so uh, I'll give three examples. One is West Virginia, the EPA, uh, uh, which I guess Noel already alluded to, a 2022 decision of the Supreme Court, where basically what was at issue there was um, an effort by the Obama administration um, uh, from 2015 to, um, to promulgate a regulation under the Clean Air Act that uh, would have restricted um, greenhouse gas emissions from existing in uh, power plants and from coal fired and natural gas fire plant, uh, uh, powered uh, uh, power plants. So basically um, what, now this regulation was actually never um, in, in in, uh, implemented because before it could be implemented in a highly unusual move at the time, the Supreme Court issued a stay even before the um, DC Circuit to, uh, had actually ruled on the merits they issued a stay um, um, uh, of this regulation. Okay. Um, so 
that's the first example. And what, why is that case significant? It's significant in environmental law context because basically um, in West Virginia EPA, the Supreme Court kind of restricted the ability of uh, the Environmental Protection Agency to um, regulate greenhouse gas emissions from existing uh, 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 natural gas and coal-fired power plants under per particular provision of the Clean Air Act, Section uh, 111. Now, importantly, though, the Supreme Court didn't say that EPA could not regulate greenhouse gas emissions under that particular provision. They said that in setting uh, uh, sort of a predicate for regulation under that provision, the best system of emission reductions, um, the uh, EPA um, could not um, basically um, take as the best system, a uh, system um, that would assume a lot of shifting of um, generation, power generation from coal-fired power plants to other kinds of renewable plants, for example. They couldn't uh, set a standard based on an assumption of, of extensive generation shifting. And the standard would have to be set based on changes the best system of emission reductions would have to be set based on changes that could occur at the power plant level. Okay, so this decision was significant because it curbed um, uh, 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 EPA's authority to kind of engage in a form of regulatory innovation under the Clean Air Act, but it didn't totally foreclose the ability to regulate greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean Air Act. Now, from a broader context, administrative law context, this case is also hugely significant um, because this is the sort of the leading articulation of the major questions doctrine and the first kind of use of the major questions doctrine to, uh, well, not maybe the first, that's a controversial statement to say. Certainly it's the first major articulation of the doctrine and application of it uh, uh, clearly to basically um, uh, invalidate a kind of re a regulatory effort. Okay, now what is example two of the curbing of the administrative state in an environmental case? So example two would be the Sackett decision from 2023. So the Sackett, so whereas in the issue, the, the sort of landmark environmental law in West Virginia PA was the Clean Air Act, in Sackett, the Supreme Court is dealing with the Clean Water Act. Okay, so another huge major environmental law of the early 1970s. Okay, so what happens in Sackett, basically Sackett is a challenge to the um, jurisdiction of the uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency and the Army Corps of Engineers to regulate wetlands under the Clean Water Act. Now, this is really actually a bit broader. It's really a, a challenge to uh, what is the, ge the geographic scope of the authority of these agencies to regulate under the Clean, Clean Water Act. Um, that uh, arises from a um, particular case where um, the agencies asserted that they had jurisdiction to uh, uh, be, uh, over uh, wetlands that were on the property of the Sackets, who owned a property, um, a lot that was near um, a lake called Priest Lake in Idaho. And they, this was actually, the, the 2023 Sackett case was actually the second Sackett case. And um, basically in the second Sackett case, um, the Supreme Court basically significantly narrows the scope of the agent, federal agency's jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. So this is actually probably um, a much more damaging decision from an environmental point of view um, uh, to, uh, to the scope of EPA and Army Corps authority under a major environmental statute than West Virginia EPA was, okay? because. By um, in the basically what the uh, the court held in the majority opinion by Justice Alito was that um, uh, uh, the agencies only have jurisdiction um, over essentially standing bodies of water like things that you would like uh, lakes for examples or rivers okay things that were relatively permanent bodies of water okay and secondly in the case of wetlands it said the the, the court said that for a wetland to fall under the jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act, the wetland had to be um, such that you couldn't really distinguish between the wetland and the water. There had to basically be a connection between um, the wetland and the water that one could see, okay? So um, so from an environmental point of view, this decision really cuts back on the, on the ability to regulate in, yeah, to basically assure water quality. Um, and 
Uh, so, and, and this is a point that's been made by a number of environmental law scholars like Rich, Richard Lazarus. So here I'm kind of drawing on his work. Okay, now from a broader administrative law point of view, Sackett is also kind of interesting because in, in narrowly interpreting the scope of, um, of uh, the uh, EPA's and the Army Corps' jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act, um, Justice Alito's majority opinion invokes these two principles of statutory construction, statutory interpretation. I'd be curious to know from Noah how well established these principles are. Okay, so one principle that he refers to in saying, well, we have to give a narrow a narrow interpretation to um, the jurisdiction here of the, the, is that there's a clear statement rule that if um, um, Congress is altering state authority um, or authority over private property, then Congress has to use clear language, okay? And basically he's uh, saying, well, they didn't, Congress didn't use clear enough language here to provide the, the scope of geographic, uh, the, the geographic scope of authority that the agencies were, were claiming. So, but it, it is interesting that there's this, this apparent canon of construction that if you're, you know, reducing uh, the rights of private property owners, um, you have to, you have, you as Congress have to say this very clearly. Not only do we have the takings clause, but we have this canon of construction, apparently. The second canon of construction was um, uh, basically the idea that, uh, that justified this narrow, narrow reading of the agency's jurisdiction was that due process requires that Congress define penal statutes with um, a sufficient definiteness that people can understand what, what's actually prohibited, okay? So there I'm quoting essentially or paraphrasing. Okay, so this is, okay, so for even, even though Sackett, I think has gotten a lot less attention than uh, West Virginia EPA, probably justifiably, it's still an interesting case from a broader administrative law point of view, okay? And an example, my, sec my second example of the curbing of, of the administration administrative state and environmental case. The third example I'll give, which is not, it's not a Supreme Court decision yet, but I'll just flag it is um, Loper Bright. So I'm surprised nobody mentioned Loper Bright yet, but um, essentially this is the next, uh, the next sort of uh, probably, uh, you know, landmark administrative law case perhaps uh, that the Supreme Court is going to hear, agreed to hear uh, this case in, in the uh, spring of this year. So basically, this is the case where um, uh, the court uh, has the opportunity to overrule the Chevron doctrine, the longstanding doctrine around since the 1980s that basically says that if a statute doesn't speak clearly to an issue, then um, the, uh, the court should defer to reasonable agency interpretation. Okay, so... Um, this, the Loper Bright decision is, or the Loper Bright case, which comes from the DC Circuit, is also an environmental case because it is a case about whether the National Marine Fisheries Service um, has the authority to uh, uh, promulgate a rule that requires uh, uh, fishermen uh, or fisher people um, um, in New England to actually uh, pay the cost of monitors that the agency is requiring them to have on board their vessels. So this is a question about does the service have the authority under the statute to require these fisher people to pay those costs, okay? And there's nothing in this statute expressly about this. So the question is, well, what, what meaning should we attribute to silence? Does this mean that there's um, ambiguity and therefore we should defer to the reasonable agency interpretation or the agency interpretation or not, okay? So again, okay, another environmental case. Uh, that will be significant in, in administrative law terms. So I think it's interesting to maybe think a bit about, well, why are some of these uh, major uh, efforts to curb the environmental, uh, to curb the administrative state, why are they arising through cases about environmental law? Okay. Um, and I think there are a couple of reasons. One is that it seems to be an easy context for some of the conservative justices to, to uh, describe a narrative of aggrandizing agency power. And that's the narrative that you, that sort of links West Virginia EPA and Sackett. In, in both those cases, Roberts and Alito are saying, well, here's an, another example of agencies claiming increasing authority. Um, and okay, so that's one aspect. Another aspect is that in both those cases, there's this sort of lurking concern about the costs that are being imposed on private property owners in SAC 
stack it on industry, on the power industry, and potentially consumers um, in in West Virginia EPA. Okay, so um, another another reason why I think that um, our, you know these environmental uh, cases are sort of um, uh, um, providing a lens for these this trend is is that these st and many of the landmark environmental laws like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act are, are old laws, okay, dating from the 1970s. These laws were often drafted in a way that actually uh, gave these agencies a, a fair amount of administrative, a fair amount of discretion, okay, pretty broadly formulated. And for understandable reasons, because at the time uh, that the federal government was really for the first time in the 1970s play, taking on a significant role in the environmental field, Congress wasn't well positioned to establish regulatory standards. This is sort of a classic example of an area where you needed expertise within the agencies, within agencies to actually try to figure out what should be the standard for particulate matter or how much, you know, of some pol pollutants should be allowed into lakes and rivers. OK, so in a way, though, the, the sort of the breadth of the authority in these statutes does provide an occasion, OK, for, you know, agency innovation. That was partly what the breadth was probably intended to allow for in the first place. But it also then provides um, uh, an occasion now for uh, sort of more conservative justices to to, to basically say, well, there's you know too much authority being claimed here. Their agencies are trying to be too transformative, and hence major questions that we need, you know, clearer congressional authority. Okay, so now on to my second theme. Okay, which I'll sort of just allude to very quickly. But my theme here is that yes, we are seeing this curbing of federal authority in the environmental context, but that does not mean that nothing is happening at the federal level. Okay, so I don't, I, yes, there's a lot of doom and gloom, but there's still, a, there's still, at least as of today, uh, scope for, you know, um, agency action at the federal level. So EPA hasn't thrown up its hands uh, uh, in, uh, about trying to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. You know, uh, just this past spring, the Biden administration came out with a new proposed rule for regulating emissions from power plants that is going to you know, require at existing coal-fired and natural gas plants that want to continue to operate for a long period of time some fairly aggressive measures, okay? And so it's kind of proving that, yeah, you know, that plan we had before, it wasn't actually necessary in a way to accomplish our goals. We can achieve it through this narrower box that you defined for us in West Virginia EPA. Um, Okay, now the story under the Clean Air Act, you know, clearly there's less scope to innovate in the face of SACIT and the, you know, the regulatory rulemaking that's uh, been the response to SACIT is basically a rule to bring the agency's authority in conformity with SACIT. So less scope for innovating there, admittedly, okay? The other thing I would say though is, well, it's not like agencies are doing nothing. The other thing that I think has kind of been interesting in the past few years is that Congress has gotten a little bit more into the game um, in the environmental law context. So one of the you know, problems in environmental law is that essentially since um, 1990, there, there weren't until fairly recently a lot of reforms to major environmental statutes. Um, except in uh, reform to the Toxic Substances Control Act in 2016, really from 1990 until relatively recently, there were not major reforms at all to these environmental laws from the 1970s. But with things like the Inflation Reduction Act, obviously creating a lot of subsidies um, in various ways for individuals, states, local governments to, uh, to uh, promote decarbonization, you see Congress getting back into the game. Now, it's not setting regulatory standards, but it is doing something to try to move the needle uh, to decarbonize, and what it's doing is actually facilitating, in a way, regulation by EPA, because as a result of those subsidies under the Inflation Reduction Act, EPA is arguing in rulemakings now, like the one proposed one for power plants, that these proposed rules are, you know, e uh, the costs are less to industry because they're going to be so heavily subsidized. Okay, so there's, and and also we've seen reforms, you know, in the debt ceiling. Uh, uh, 
whatever you want to call it, the debt ceiling agreement or legislation from 2023 reforms to, to the National Environmental Policy Act. Not what I would call earth shattering reforms, but some reforms to an environmental statute that really hadn't been changed much since the 1970s. Okay. Okay. So there is still response at the federal level. Okay. There's still something happening in the environmental context. The, the third thing I wanted to move to, though, was sort of, well, what's happening at the state and local levels in the face of this sort of, you know, seeming retrenchment, the curbing of the authority that you're seeing uh, by the by the courts at the at, uh, at the federal level. So it's interesting. You've seen, as you might expect, a kind of bifurcated response. Right. So there's some states that you know, are out there trying to respond. So, if, for example, on, car, on uh, climate change, uh, I think it's about 24 states in the District of Columbia have economy-wide targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So New York State is one of these states, one of the kind of leading states with one of the most aggressive climate laws, okay? So, of course, then you have the other half that really are not doing much at all, okay? What's going to happen under the uh, to deal with what's happening in the uh, un, under the Clean Water Act and you know the um, addressing water pollution? So according to you know some uh, stuff I saw after the Sackett decision, probably about half the states um, are actually regulating to protect wetlands, and so you know, maybe not all of them so stringently, but at but again, it's sort of like a little bit parallel to the climate change context. The states are divided. Half have something in place. The other half don't really have anything in place. So in those states, there probably will be a lot of diminution in the protections for wetlands and um, in, in increased water pollution as a result. Okay. Now, an interesting thing is, let's just focus um, for a second on the state's that have the economy-wide targets to deal with um, uh, 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 climate change and to try to promote decarbonization. Okay, so this is this year I'm going to pick up on one of Rick's themes. Okay, so Rick's themes was uh, one of your themes is about you know increasing state preemption of lo of local government activity. So interestingly, in some of these states, like New York would be an example, that are committed to decarbonizing. You are again in New York, you are seeing preemption of local authority in the service of achieving decarbonization, okay? So, um, and this, you know, arises partly from the fact that decarbonization requires the construction of a lot of renewable energy facilities. And as one might expect, I wouldn't want to live next to a wind turbine myself, um, there's local opposition in communities to, to, to some of these renewable facilities, okay? And so, in New York, you've seen the state come in and establish this centralized process for siting large scale renewable facilities that enables the state to preempt a local government um, regulations that would thwart that siting. Okay, so that's kind of an example for your, your point. Now, what about in the states that, you know, the, tw the other 25 states that are not really doing, don't have economy wide targets to decarbonize? So in those states too, there's the same, there's a phenomenon of state preemption of local governments, okay? But this time in the service of thwarting efforts by local governments to achieve things like decarbon, to achieve decarbonization. So for example, Texas would be another example where, um, uh, so something that initially there was actually Berkeley in California that sort of began this idea of that you know, local governments could ban the installation of new natural gas infrastructure in new in new buildings that were being constructed to avoid the uh, gas being perpetuated as a source of energy. Okay, so then what happened, you know, is a bunch of states, including Texas, came out and basically banned local governments from instituting these natural gas bans. Okay, so on both the in both the progressive states and the well. The other states, the, the red states, you see the same tendency towards preemption in the service of, you know, um, uh, thwarting uh, local goals. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic to think about. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll just kind of stop there then so we can have some time for questions. <laughs> well, that's great. Th thank you, Professor Wyman. Um,
let me um just give you one one question, but it's it's a a big one, I think. Um, you know, we, apropos of our red um blue divide that we've talked about um quite a lot, and your remarks about the um, inherent nature of this divide um, with regard to the states and federalism. Um, and even if you assume that the various um, politics around red and, and blue states um, disappeared and became more manageable, I wonder whether you would make a, a guess as to whether the law as it stands under this constitution with this court would allow any kind of integrated climate change solution, particularly with regard to the inventory of issues that you've raised, which are, for example, the major question um, issue um, affecting not just regulation, but legislation the rules of construction where things now suddenly need to be clearer than they need to be um, in the past. And um, the um, also um, indications that um, statutes that are too long um, taxes tax the, the judiciary's patience, the various matrix of takings now and in the future um, with regard to pollution and property rights um, and state and local regulation, which is by its nature not um, comprehensive. Um, what are we to do with what might be civilization's biggest problem over the next 20 to 100 years? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a really important question, and there is kind of a literature on this question of um, the capacity of, of government um, to, to address climate change. I mean, my, my view is that, yes, I do think that it is possible at the federal level that you could have a comprehensive uh, legislative and regulatory approach to, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to, to, uh, you know, to, to try to limit climate change. I think that it would. I, I. I think that the Supreme Court, you know, efforts to curb the federal regulatory state, though, mean that even it, it mean that this has to come through legislation. It has to come from Congress. Okay, and I think people have known that for a long time, right? And 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 you know, um, it, that's. I'm not saying anything new here. And why why did we get the Clean Power Plan and these re various regulations? It's because Congress hasn't really been able to address this problem. And so in the face of that congressional inertia, you've basically um, had these agencies try to regulate. Now, it's I, the Inflation Reduction Act was a game changer in the sense that that was Congress entering the field, okay, of addressing climate change, not in a regulatory way, but in a let's provide lots of money and hope a lot of flowers bloom kind of way, okay? From a historical perspective, though, I think if you look back at, you know, the prehistory of the 1970s environmental statutes, you know, they, they, you know, they were preceded by federal funding for state and local efforts. And so the optimistic part of me hopes that the IRA is just like installment one, okay, um, of, of congressional efforts, okay. I think though that also that given um, the Supreme Court's jurisprudence and administrative law, the uh, if Congress were to pass a statute to deal with climate change of the sort I think is necessary, it would have to take a somewhat different form than the 1970s era statute. It would have to be you know, to avoid things like the major questions doctrine or to limit the litigation risk of, of you know in light of these various canons of construction. Congress would have to be a lot more specific, okay, it would, and um, about and in the way it drafted that statute, so that there was less scope for industry challengers or state states that are opposed to climate change regulation to successfully win, you know, some kind of um, cha challenge under the statute. So I still think it's possible, but 
um, you know, it's clearly a political issue, and I think it would have to take a slightly different response, a form of response than the 1970s era study. Right. Well, thank you, Pro Professor Wyman. And I, I think that um, it is where we can move to um, kind of an open-ended conversation, which I, I hope um, everyone there uh, has their open um, mics on. And um, it's pretty much open season for comments back and forth, rebuttals and so forth. I'm going to start with a with a, a medium sized question, but maybe the most important question that I can come up with um, based upon um, now almost all four of the federalism programs that we've done. And it's probably not fair for us, uh, our, the, our three um, speakers in the, the last session um, to start to, to uh, look at the, the biggest pictures here, but that's what we have. So what, what, what my question is to start is, is that it seems to me that um, in many ways, the 2020s in America looks a lot like the pre-Civil War period. It, it resembles the debates that we saw in our session two of this um, group of, of sessions about abortion um, and um, so-called abortion trafficking. And it resembles um, the, the, in that sense, the Fu Fugitive um, Slave Act and the, the Dred Scott decision and the, uh, and the extension or not of slavery at that time. We are in a situation where red states are busing um, <clears throat> immigrants north as, uh, as, as fast as they can, it, it seems, and have um, budgets to try to try to do that with the federal government involved um, trying to mediate, um, but not successfully at this point. We have several different um, states, um, mi mi militias um, rented on the, the, the border um, with other red states. God knows what that could, what kind of chaos or worse could, could happen. And so the, the question for me is, is there a real risk of dissolution of the union? Or is this um, rhetoric? Anyone can start first. <laughs> I nominate Rick. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, the reason let me let me give no, a historian's you're answer. Historian, Noah. <laughs> That's <Okay. true. laughs> Here's the historian's answer reason why I think Rick should answer, which is that that I, so my my take is that it's more rhetoric than reality, and for for two reasons. So the big reason is that the role of slavery in the United States and in making the early republic and the challenges connected to it are of a wholly different order than even the major divisions we're facing today and the existential threat of anthropogenic climate change. So I think that, that it's hard to make that comparison despite the sense of division. And, and the reason that I wanna bring Rick into the conversation is because of the point that he made about the, the way in which our country is divided. So while the representation publicly is red states, blue states, pro and anti Texas, New York, the reality, as Rick's research and, and as his presentation today really drove home, is that it's, you know, it's Austin versus the suburbs. It's New York City versus Dutchess County, where my dad lives. And while it is true that in the 1850s there were divisions within states, they didn't look anything like the divisions within states today. So New York City, right, is like closely allied to Southern slaveholding capital. And yet, nevertheless, the way that New York, New York nevertheless, is in fact an abolitionist um, town, even though it's closely connected to Southern slaveholding capital. And New York State is, you know, all for the union. Meanwhile, you go to Virginia, right, and even though, or South Carolina is an even better example, 
even though there are major divisions within South Carolina between the the um, slavers, the rich coastal slavers, and the poorer whites, and there are union loyalists within South Carolina, the ruling class is united in its desire for secession, and it penetrates relatively deeply. So I'm, I'm not a historian of the Civil War. There are you know, historians who would know this who could give you a much more um, nuanced account. But my sense is that the ways we're divided now are different from the ways we were divided then. And so um, that doesn't mean there couldn't be other kinds of disaggregation, but my sense is that is that the, the story that Rick is telling us gives us a reason to understand why this isn't gonna look like, like, like disunion of that form. So I will jump in and I will also connect it a little bit, I think to a, a statement that Katrina made and also a question I think uh, in the comments, right? Um, which is to say that, I think right now, if we focus, and I think everyone is focused right now on outcomes, just results, we kind of miss this bigger picture I think Robert's presenting, right? So we're like, so preemption could go either way, right? State preemption could help or hurt depending on what side you're on. Uh, but I think there's a different question, which is how we get at the outcomes affects how people feel. And I feel like the reason why we have a federal system or our countries adopt a federal system, right, in that regard, is to ensure that if there is some geographic disparity, right, in how people are organized, that there is a sense of agency with various groups. And actually, this gets a little bit to Robert's issue, which is not just about the outcomes, it's about the structure, right? Because I do think that the more you have foreclosure of those outlets, right, foreclosure of outlets for people that might lose on one level to go to another level, or people that say, well, you know, in my town, or in my block or my neighborhood, this is what we do. This is our cultural values, or this is what uh, we want to sort of present or something like that. So to the extent that we're divided both partisan and culturally, how we then structure, right, whether these outlets exist, I think does get to your question of whether or not at some point the pressure point is going to be too much that people feel, and maybe we're getting there, right, that I have no outlet to actually accomplish anything and short of some radical revolution, that outlet doesn't exist. And I feel like we feel that on the left and the right, right? People on the left and the right feel this sort of sense of disaffection or lack of agency. And what we may not be realizing is that some of that may be because every time we want to win for an outcome, we keep foreclosing outlets, right? We want to have total, total war and we want to win totally. But every time we do that, we foreclose more outlets. I actually had this interest in this paper I you know wrote recently, kind of looking at this sort of weird conundrum, like, you know, rural America in one telling is like disproportionately powerful. On the other hand, in another telling, they are completely disaffected and feel disempowered. And I looked into it and at least I speculate, right? Or at least, you know, my thesis was it might actually be based on the type of agency that can actually exercise at the local level, right? The sense of like, face-to-face -face, like participatory agency. Uh, and I sort of noted that actually rural local governments are just distinctly weaker than every other type of local governments, even in red states. Uh, on the other hand, I noted that it does appear that in rural areas, state and federal officials just operate more expansively than let's say in New York City does, right? Which is mostly just New York City officials and channel through New York City officials, right? So, you know, I don't want to sort of give you, I mean, right, but the fact that they channel this frustration into this sort of like burn everything down might be that they have not felt that they had an outlet and strangely enough, the outlet might be the local level, right? Even there, it's funny because they hate state officials too. It's really strange, even though they're winning these state elections, but there's this frustration. So I, I think the structure and the outlet question might actually be connected to this bigger question of, I don't know, collapse or apocalypse, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I'm i not a historian and can't draw the comparison to the uh, pre-Civil War period, but I guess one thing I would say is I think, I, I, I like Rick's point about, you know, the structures and do people have enough kind of places to go, but I think a lot a, a lot of the tensions that we're seeing are, are rooted in economic concerns, and it's not it's not purely about sort of the uh, system of, of governance and stuff, and, and it, there's... And and so and you know I I do think there's a there's an 
a need to address some of the economic concerns in rural areas. Um, and of course, there are also, though, real economic concerns in some of our large cities, you know, um, and post pandemic, you know, what's happened to the nature of the office industry, you know, the, uh, uh, the decline in people going to offices. So there's a lot of economic issues that I think um, also play a, a major role in underpinning all these tensions. Any other thoughts? Well, let me let me sw switch gears then and maybe try to be a, a little bit more hopeful than the question um, previous. Um, we, we, I think each of us, um, all three of you, ha have talked about um, experimentation with federalism. And um, I think you've given some examples of where there could be opportunities for experimentation um, with regard to the structure of, of government um, and federalism. Um, and, and there are certain st structures already existing um, that may, for good or for bad, um, be part of the solution or part of the problem. There are associations of, for example, um, district attorneys and prosecutors, both red states and blue states, and then within urban states um, and urban um, centers. There are um, various non-federal military militias. I mentioned that earlier today. Um, and that is um, their own sort of club at this point. We have um, various organizations, um, private organizations that um, deal with um, le creating legislation, model, um, model um, laws, right? Um, the American Law, Law Association that I'm a, a member of is is one of those. I think one for for the for the good rather than the bad. But there are all kinds of clubs that create um, influence. There are regional development um, organizations. We've talked about a couple of those um, just very recently. There are um, compacts to deal with waters and conservation, particularly in the American West. Um, there are intra-urban areas, like in New York, the Grand Central Conservancy and equivalents in Manhattan and the, the boroughs. Um, we've talked about um, Disney in Florida. All of this seems to me to be a, a good um, um, boiling pot um, into which we can uh, submerge a whole bunch of policy issues, um, but the politics can get in the way too. So I'd love to hear your your views of whether there's um, a good or bad or a balance or what, what where this could go in terms of experimentation. I mean, I'll jump in really quickly and acknowledge that I'm a little biased on these matters. Um, I do think that in some ways, right, I think the political moment we're in is this sort of frustration with just being sort of reactionary, right, being anti. And whether or not, I mean, this is so uh, early to 2010s, but like whether or not there's like a hopeful path, like someone could actually present a vision of that we can sort of follow, like that's positive, right, in some ways. Um and I think we can sit around and wait for, you know, the, the you know, whatever, the prophet to come and give us the message and then we all follow and that's fine. But I, I think what you described in some ways is, and I feel like I'm getting this a little bit from the next generation of my students, is that it is these sort of many outlets, whether or not it's governmental or civil society or whatever it is, in which people are able to at least at a level carry out some particular action without essentially waiting for Congress to be able to act on it. And this is not to say that Congress acting on it is not important, but I think we have to realize that there are movements that build to anything that happens. Like when the federal government stepped in with civil rights, that movement has been going on forever, right? That wasn't like, oh, the federal government just stepped in, we're done. It was like, no, you had to build up to it. And even the move for like minimum wage increase, I mean, a lot of this happens in very sort of discrete levels, and then they kind of a sort of role, but I think 
to have that sense of actually doing, as Heather Gurkin say, is more than just advocating for, right? So I think having all these outlets in which things can be done, maybe that is the sort of scattered realm by which we build uh, a sense of hope, as opposed to waiting for, you know, the one person to like guide us or something like that, which right? a more centralized vision. So I think that is a hopeful vision and whether that's local governments or civil society or these organizations, you know, maybe that's what we should be focusing on and not as much as, not to say Congress isn't important or the state legislation is important, but to see that as an exclusive uh, realm uh, with all the gatekeeping and agenda setting that that happens there. Yeah, I think what Rick said is, is I agree with what Rick said, just going back to, you know, my niche area of the environmental area. You know, the Inflation Reduction Act didn't just emerge out of nowhere or many of the Biden administration initiatives, you know, they they were building on things that had happened, you know, were happening in some of the, the more ambitious states like New York or California. And these things got scaled up to the federal level. Um, so I think I think an interesting question is um, to what extent will the current members of the court or the, the current conservative majority of the court, to what extent? Is it going to allow or is it going to also circumscribe the ability of states and local governments to innovate? So, so far, like we've been talking about the curbing of the authority of federal agencies to to innovate. And in, in like the Sackett case, the Clean Water Act case, the court emphasized, well, you know, clean water, this is a traditional area of state responsibility, whatever. So uh, so that suggests like an openness to state regulation. But I guess I'd be curious whether Rick and Noah have views here. I mean, my view so far is it's not exactly clear whether the, I think it's too early. My impression is it's too early to know, well, how much is this current court going to be open? Are they going to try to use, whether it's preemption or certain constitutional doctrines to curtail that potential for innovation at the state and local level? So just to jump in real quick in response to that, like I do see that as a concern. And the funny thing is, it, it, it's sort of, I, you know, I saw Cedar Point Nursery, the takings decision and Bruin, the second amendment decision. And look, it does not say I like Dobbs, right? But like I saw those as sort of secret, like subterranean cases that might have bigger impact because they block out all regulation, right? I mean, yes, it's in a individual right or some sort of personal right, but they sort of, sort of it becomes a court sort of thing, but they block out all state local. Again, Dobbs is not great, but there's still room in which you can advocate. There's still room in which you can, and we've seen even red states sort of advocate. So I do think that the court has been very aggressive, I mean, or the uh, First Amendment cases, right, about anti-discrimination, right, uh, anti right, ordinances. All those have been striking down, you know, a lot of them actually are striking down local ordinances, right, uh, in those cases. So it's weird because it's not in the realm of preemption. And certainly they're not, they've completely abandoned the old federalism local control argument, right? And that's not even coming here because it's not relevant. But I do see the Supreme Court making a lot of steps to limit governmental power generally, but I think actually fixated on, because most of these are really happening at the local state level as opposed to Congress. Uh, but, you know, they're kind of wrapped in this package that no one really sees this as stripping away uh, more agency authority uh, for you to do what you want in your community. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, not your grandpa's federalism anymore, is it? <laughs> well, we have about two minutes and um, now I think you're going to get the last, the last word. Oh dear. I wasn't ready for that. I very much agree <laughs> with, uh, with <laughs> Katrina. Maybe the two things I'll say on that score are just that um, I think that uh, the institutional problems that we face, that's part of what's being surfaced here. So in order to have innovation and experimentation at the local level, we need not only to be able to be free from a Supreme Court that's trying to shut that down, but also we're going to have to invest capacity in our state and local governments. I do a fair amount of state and local government work here in New York, and it's remarkable how uh, much our legislators try to do given the conditions in which they operate. They often don't have access to knowledgeable staff. They often operate without a lot of public awareness or engagement, which creates opportunities for people like um, the folks on this on this Zoom training, uh, on this Zoom CLE, you know, lawyers in New York who have expertise, who have status in their community to really make a difference. Your legislature really does want to hear from you and that will, will make a difference. 
And then the second point, and this is just a piggyback on something that Rick and Katrina were gesturing towards, that democracy has always been about citizens coming together to try to do something. And I think many of us don't have many experiences of that kind of empowerment, but certainly in American history, that's been the cornerstone of democratic change. And all it takes to rediscover that uh, good democratic feeling is to talk to your neighbors and people who share your values to try to make change in the world. And I think once you catch that bug, there's a lot you can do with it. And I think as lawyers, we're especially well-situated both to do that ourselves in our communities and to lead others to do it, and then to make sure that the rules are such that others can continue to do it. So I I, uh, I, I share Katrina's optimistic strain. I want to embrace Rick's 2010 optimistic vision. I, for one, still believe that the sun Franklin saw is a rising sun, not a setting sun. I, I feel better already. I'm going to turn think it I... Thank you. Thank you for, for our... Uh, our speakers and um, your good. Uh, yeah, well, I will uh, wrap Mercy. it up here at the end. Uh, add my thanks uh, on behalf of the Rule of Law Task Force, our series planners, and our co sponsors uh, to uh, Professors Noah Rosenblum, Katrina Wyman, and Rick Sue. I think this was a tremendously stimulating and thought provoking discussion. Uh, I'm sorry we did not have time to get to everybody's questions. We did answer some of them uh, privately. Um, the program is being uh, recorded and uh, will soon be available on our website. Uh, the uh, website is, uh, uh, the link is listed in the chat that everyone can have access to. Um, and, um, you know, please let your colleagues know about it and uh, have them tune in too. I, I myself am hopeful that the new approach uh, that Katrina talked about from the uh, IRA is the sort of thing that NOAA is looking forward to, that all that money will go to the localities if they can figure out how to get their hands on it, which from what I know seems to be an issue. Um, although work is being done. I, I, I just at the Bar Association last evening, um, I, I learned that uh, both the city and state bar are going to put a task force together to, to work on that here here in New York. So, and other entities are, are as well. So. Um, uh, all, we, we all have to be hopeful. Hope requires uh, energy, um, as, as um, I, I, the rabbi of our congregation said on uh, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, it's not just something idle. You have to do it. So uh, I want to say that uh, this uh, sort of unhappily brings our series to a close. It's been fantastic. Um, and I hope that uh, everybody in the audience has found it helpful. Uh, as we all go forward to work to try to keep democracy and the rule of law afloat in these perilous waters. I thank you all and wish you good night.